And on that note, I'm going to hand over to a very esteemed uh, set of speakers. Uh, so the Titanic Belfast, it's, uh, I think it needs no, ex no introduction or explanation, but uh, Claire is going to take us through how you've been working on the digital visitor experience there. So please welcome Claire to the stage. And Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so I am Claire and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager at Titanic Belfast. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about our digital um, innovation and transformation journey. Um, as most of you will know in the room, it's not something that ever ends, it's an ongoing process. Um, so we're really sort of at the start of our journey still. Um, it's something that we have been working on over a number of years and we have still lots of projects to, to continue with. So. First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the projects that we have worked on and some of the upcoming projects. The first thing that really we began our journey with was that digitizing the customer journey. And sort of, it's quite nice to see Nick's um, presentation this morning and a lot of these sort of ring a, ring a lot of um, home truths for us. We were already quite a digital business. We had established websites, booking um, sort of online, all of those kind of things, online ticketing. And then really the pandemic kind of helped us to accelerate that a little bit more in terms of our digital journey. The customers um, that come to Titanic Belfast don't always want to book online. They want a little bit of freedom. They want to change their plans around. They wanted to just arrive and buy a ticket whenever they got there. So COVID really kind of actually accelerated that digital and mobile journey for us. We had the infrastructure there, but it really gave our customers that incentive to use the, the, the platforms that we had. Um, that was from our mobile ticketing, which um, people used to come and queue at our ticketing desks and stand and buy a ticket and they liked a physical ticket in their hand. Um, we had online um, booking and a mobile ticket delivered to their email and that really after the pandemic encouraged people to use that. So now that's a sort of very seamless journey for people that can come in, show their um, ticket on their mobile and never have to sort of um, engage with our staff at the attraction if they, unless they want to. Another thing that, that came out of the pandemic really and it's that sustainability journey that we're all on as well is um, things like reducing our collateral around the experience. Um, one thing that we did really quickly um, after the pandemic was to turn all of our digital, uh, all of our maps into digital formats um, so that they can be used by our customers on their mobile as they go around the experience instead of picking up a, a piece of paper whenever they come in. And that's been really successful. People have really engaged with that. Um, and that's really key for our language users as well. So they're translated in all different languages that we welcome customers from all over the world. And one of the other things that we, oh, sorry, skipped on too far. Um, one of the other things that we really took time over the pandemic to do was look at our customer engagement and our feedback. This was something that we needed to streamline. We knew we needed to streamline it. We looked at new systems to help us do that. We now use a system called Zendesk, which I'm sure many people will be familiar with. But that helps us to really um, streamline all of those customer contacts that come in. And that's from pre-visit, during their visit, and post-visit. And that's something that we, um, we felt really strongly we could do more with. We needed to use the information that we were getting from our customers um, in a more meaningful way. And the new system really let us do that. We can set up reports. We can look at um, who's contacting us, what platforms they're using to contact us, whether they're phoning, whether they're contacting us through our live chat on our website, through a web form. Um, and we can see where they're coming from. We can see what their inquiry is about. We can run reports on that and really use that to inform the operational side of our business. So that's been really, really successful for us. And part of that then we have tied in our customer satisfaction surveys that we do around the building. Um, and that just gives us a really good data picture of our, our customer whenever they visit us, um, engaging all of those touch points into one system and being able to um, use that to look at trends, for example, and um, see if there's a certain number of complaints about something occurring and then we can really quickly be reactive and remedy that. The next thing that we looked at was really engaging our customer experience or enhancing sorry, our customer experience and that's something that I'm going to talk a little bit more about in my presentation today. Um, 
As some of you might be aware, we have just completed a £4.5 million refresh to the Titanic experience. And this was really about enhancing that customer experience with digital and other innovation methods. Um, dreaming big is in our DNA. We always say, like the designers who built Titanic, we you know, want to dream really big with the experience that we offer. Um, and we want to continually innovate how we do that. We were 10 years old last year, um, and we started this project about five years ago. Um, so I'll, I'll not go into it too much just yet, but I'll take you through that in a little bit more detail. And then alongside that, we have things like our multimedia guides um, that are offered to enhance the experience with um, our guests whenever they get there. And obviously, any change to the experience is an opportunity for change to those kind of platforms that we use as an upselling tool. But it's also really important for our language speakers whenever they visit the attraction. So things that we have at the minute in place are very audio-led. So the new guide that we're, we're continuing to work on at the minute, it's not quite launched yet, is a lot more multimedia. Um, it includes a little bit of gamification, it includes interactives that people can use, um, and that really kind of brings that to life a little bit more and helps enhance that experience for our guests. Another key project then that we worked on um, in the last couple of years really, since our building turned 10, as I'm sure you'll know, everything is um, on a life cycle project. Um, we had to work on a few things like our Wi-Fi, upgrading those, um, the systems that enable us to really use the data from that a little bit better, use our um, Wi-Fi for marketing messages and collect a little bit more data from our customers. That project is just completed, so there's still a bit of work to be done on that in terms of the marketing benefits of that upgrade. Another thing we've done is um, change our car park. Um, we have a lot of new digital innovation in our car park systems, our payment methods, um, the barriers, um, and just making them a wee bit more technologically advanced so that whenever our customers come, it's not just about the experience that they get in the attraction, it's about the experience they have when they visit us as a whole from the car park right through to the experience and then after they leave. And the last one there is linking with our environs, and that's really where we work with um, the wider destination, um, be that the maritime mile around us or the wider sort of Belfast and Northern Ireland environment. Um, we work with partners, we collaborate an awful lot on this. Um, and again, it's about making that journey for our customers really seamless whenever they come to the destination. It's not just um, that they have a really good experience at Titanic Belfast, it's that the connectivity to get there and to experience um, around the destination lives up to that same level. So um, we work really closely with people like Maritime Belfast Trust who promote the Maritime Mile um, and our partners in industry along the Maritime Mile. Um, they're doing really good things on a connectivity project in the area at the minute. Um, Belfast Harbour are working on a lot of new tech and digital um, innovation um, and there's projects that we can work with them hopefully in the future on developing that. In terms of future projects, um, this is something that, as I say, always ongoing. We are currently looking at a systems audit at the minute. Um, as a 10-year-old business, we have systems that have been in place for since before we opened, um, and we're just looking at whether or not they are still suitable for what we need, if they talk together to the best of their ability, if we can use them, you know, if our data is shared across them, does that give us a, bit, a meaningful, holistic picture of our customer across our business? And then there's some sort of um, other bits and pieces that we still need to do that go hand in hand with that sustainability journey that we're on. Um, as Nick sort of mentioned, digital can be really embedded in that and can really help with um, how we innovate and become a bit more sustainable as a business, um, particularly around our building in terms of digital signage and wayfinding and, and so on. So there's a project in that that we're going to have a look at um, in the next wee while as well. So what I'm going to... Um, talk a little bit more about today is that enhancing the customer experience and how we do that with digital innovation. As I mentioned, we have completed uh, probably our most ambitious project to date, which is a 4.5 million pound refresh of the Titanic experience. It's um, the largest refresh we've done to the experience since we opened. We always continually sort of do little bits and pieces of, of changes to it, but this is something that we wanted to do on a, on a bigger scale. We started it um, in 2018, I believe, um, it was meant to initially be a three-year project. Um, COVID sort of postponed that a little bit, turned into a five-year project. But um, the aim of this was really to enhance the experience, um, make it a little bit more innovative, um, continue to engage our customers, um, and give them a real wow factor. We also wanted to make sure that we attracted both new and returning customers. So 10 years in, 
um, enough of the experience has changed that people who have, we've had seven million visitors visit us over the last 10 years, um, you know, we really want them to come back and experience the, the new changes and see it again. Um, another thing that we really wanted to do was make sure that our customer insights and our data insights have been um, used and put back into the experience. So we have loads of information from over you know, the first 10 years of operation about what our customers think of the experience. We know ourselves operationally, you know, what worked and what didn't. Um, so we use that to really inform the project in a really practical way. We, um, an, an example of that really can be, if anybody has been through the Titanic experience, you'll know in the first part of the experience, it's very detail oriented. There's a lot of information thrown at you. Um, you learn about industrial Belfast and you learn about the shipbuilding. You learn about um, the fit out of Titanic and um, its maiden journey. Um, so there's a lot of reading and not everybody reads everything, but there is a lot of information and a lot of cognitive load taken as people go through. So we knew that as people reached that sort of two thirds of the experience mark, they started to fatigue a little bit. They got a little bit tired. Um, they maybe sort of rushed through the end of the experience because they sort of thought, well, that's, that's about enough for me. You know, I've, I've taken all my brain can take. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that that latter part of the experience didn't just sort of let people leave with that sort of I'm tired now, I'm going to go impression. And we really wanted to make that a lot more sensory um, and not have the, the same level of reading and um, cognitive load required. So this is something that we set out to do as a really collaborative project. We also wanted to bring in aspects of the experience that we hadn't really touched on before. So we have you know, interactives and different things throughout the experience as it is, um, a lot of interpretation visually and, and text oriented but we wanted to bring in a lot more animation. We wanted to work with filmmakers. We wanted to work with um, spatial architects um, and also some sort of um, musical element. So this was really important to us to work with all of these people who are really good in their industries um, to bring a much more rounded experience to the Titanic experience. So for anybody who maybe hasn't seen it yet, what we did was we had nine galleries before we took the last three galleries, the last third of the experience, and replaced it with four new ones. Um, this, what I'm gonna go through now is gonna show you a little bit more about what we did in each gallery and how we use sort of elements of innovation to enhance that customer experience um, and make it a little bit more stand out. So to transition between the old and the new, because it is one project, um, it's one product, it will be one experience for people. We wanted to make sure that we um, kind of introduced the new areas a little bit um, more seamlessly. So we enhanced the end of, of the existing gallery, the sinking gallery. Now this gallery didn't change bar a few elements. Um, and really the largest introduction was this memorial wall. Um, this is a sort of stretch fabric wall that's backlit. We used um, some digital um, projections on it to really provide a little bit of analysis about um, those who were on board Titanic um, at the time of impact. So um, this is not something that's high tech and, and you'll find this as I go through. Sometimes what we did to innovate is not particularly digital or high tech. Um, there are elements of that that are really impressive, but you know, it's about looking at what the space needed and not trying to just shoehorn and something in that didn't fit or didn't be needed in a certain place. So this gallery is quite reflective, you know, it's a, it's a somber topic. Um, and what we did was also introduce um, a number of artifacts from the Titanic story. Um, this is what people really connect with. They connect with personal stories and they connect emotionally. And that was a big um, aim of us for this experience. So we wanted to make sure that the digital innovation and the original Maritime Heritage Collection really went hand in hand and that they complemented each other, that it wasn't you were looking at one or the other. And this is a really nice example of that, where we have the life jacket against the wall of names and it creates a really poignant moment of reflection for our guests. The next new space is called Never Again and this really details the um, chain reaction of events that caused Titanic to sink and then the measures that were put in place to prevent that from happening again. So again, not particularly high tech, but um, the dominoes are a bit of a metaphor. We use these tumbling dominoes to represent that chain reaction of events. 
But we, we do that through animation. So the digital screens within the dominoes have really lovely animation that help our guests understand the reasons for um, Titanic sinking and how that completely changed the maritime industry and how it made it much safer for people. We also have interactives um, that people can use to delve a little bit more uh, into the sort of inquiries that took place after Titanic sinking. Um, you can pull up personal stories and deep dive into them a little bit more if you want to. And then you can see here, there's a picture of the model of Titanic. This is actually, although it kind of looks 2D in this picture, this is actually a 3D model. And what we did was we looked at various different ways that we could very cleverly represent this area, which is called the void. And it's, it's to represent Titanic after she sank, where she was on the seabed, but she hadn't been found yet. Um, so she was missing. It was the void, the period of time, number of years, where nobody knew where Titanic was. And there was all sorts of different ways that we could have done this really cleverly with high-tech digital innovation. But actually what we came back to and settled on was a 3D model of the ship that's painted in a, a paint called Banta Black. It's the darkest paint known to exist. And it actually makes 3D objects appear as if they're 2D. So it's a bit of an optical illusion when you're standing looking at it, when you take a photo of it, it's quite hard to kind of get across unless you're there. But it sort of just represents that, you know, that the ship was there, but it was missing. And it's sort of the 3Dness, but the 2Dness of it. So sometimes it can be, it doesn't have to be really techy. It can just be paint. It can just be, in, you know, something that's innovative in a different way. Ballard's Quest is the next space, and this is really, um, again, where we kind of kept the, the technology quite low key. A lot of the um, content within this um, details Dr. Ballard's technology that he used to find Titanic. It's about his pursuit of dreams, his childhood dream to find the ship. Um, what we wanted to do was really not overshadow that discovery by making it about fancy things that we did within the, the space. So we have some nice sort of animations, we have some digital projections, and we have um, some kind of good old classic infinity mirrors and different things like that, and little interactives within the space. But what we really focus on here is the really rare footage of the discovery that we were able to get by partnering with Dr. Ballard and having footage from his ship that can be seen you know, on these really old, um, and we purposely make things look old in this because it's to represent the era the Titanic was um, sort of discovered. So we have the, the top secret story on the laptop that is very old fashioned sort of top secret mission type um, interactive. And then we have these really old computer screen TV screens that set out, you know, the big ones that you used to have in your house whenever you were a kid. Um, and it just shows the, the race against time and the footage on it of them sitting looking at these big old fashioned TV screens every day, um, looking for Titanic on the bottom of the ocean. So as this sort of draws to the end, the linear story of Titanic, the next gallery is where we put a lot of our digital innovation. And it's probably the one that if anybody has been through the experience so far, it's that wow moment. It is that sort of spectacular piece that kind of catches you. Um, as you go around the corner, we really enter a dreamscape. And this is the ship of dreams. It's a massive space, if anybody's familiar with the, the room, you know, it's, it's a really huge room and it has floor to ceiling projections. Um, so as you walk around the circular staircase, um, you are walking around completely immersed in this experience. You do really immerse yourself in this dreamscape. You put yourself in the position of the people that you're seeing. You might um, be standing as you go around the stairs and a boiler swings past your head in the projections. You might be standing beside a shipyard worker and it's life size. You know, you really are in that position with them. You walk through the story with them. And it recaps the experience um, from building Titanic right through her journey and her sinking, um, but in a really, really emotive way. As you walk around the staircase, you're walking around the centerpiece of this gallery, which is a 7.6 million pound, or 7.6 meter long um, scale model of the ship. Um, it has over 300 LED lights that are all programmed individually. They um, illuminate in sync with the um, stories that are being told and the projections around you. We also have a bespoke score that we created. We had a composer in um, Amsterdam create a bespoke score for us that um, is playing quite loudly in this experience to sort of um, really work together with the, the films that you're seeing, the um, ship model and the score to 
immerse you completely in what you are seeing and feeling. The ship model rotates. Um, it took about six months to build that off-site and about three weeks to program within the experience, along with all the mappings that need was needed for the projections. So it really is state-of-the-art um, innovation and technology. Um, it's not something that um, we kind of thought when we started out the project we would end up with. Um, at the time when we started it, VR was definitely a buzzword. It was the new thing, the new technology. Everybody wanted to include that. We looked at it. We looked at it how we could maybe make that work for an attraction of our size. Um, what was unique about this project was we had to very much make sure that we kept our visitor flow. We kept our capacities. We weren't able to you know, put anything in that would impact those because we are we can welcome up to 4,000 people a day, you know, in, in high season, and we had to make sure that we could service that, continue, you know, to continue to service that with the changes. Um, and we just couldn't really make it work for us to put VR in this experience, to make it the immersive experience that we wanted to. So this is an alternative way to do that, and we think we've really achieved that. We have made this um, sort of space completely immersive. People have been in here since opening in floods of tears. They, you know, feel completely overwhelmed and emotional by the experience, which is not nice. We don't want to make people cry, but at the same time, we kind of know we're doing a good job if they feel that emotional and that connected to our story. Um, so it's been really moving to see that, that we have been able to achieve the same type of experience, just in a different way. The other addition to this space is um, sort of a little bit more low-key. We have interactives that have um, elements on them that use historical photography. And we've colorized those and done sort of um, a little bit of work on the photography to really humanize that personal story, um, which people have been really loving as well. It's a really simple thing, but actually when you look at a black and white photo versus a colorized version of it, it's amazing how the difference that it makes to you actually understanding that this was a, a person who was on board and connecting with them. And then another thing that we um, have in the space is the remainder of the collection of our artifacts. So that maritime heritage collection um, and those tangible pieces of Titanic's history go hand in hand with the innovation in this space to really tell that authentic Titanic story in a really compelling way. So it helps the people con that visit us connect with the Titanic story in a variety of ways. Everybody in this space connects with it in a different way. Um, some people take a lot from it. Some people just enjoy watching the, the film around them. Um, some people get really emotional. Um, so it's been really amazing for us to see how this um, project has transformed that visitor experience. It's also um, something that has enabled us to really meet the aims of the project that we set out. So while we thought we maybe would do it in a different way, what we've actually achieved completely met the same aims that we had just by using different types of technology. So sometimes when you set out to do something, you think you're going to do one thing, and it actually ends up being something else, but it, it works. And then just in the last space, we have the last in legacy, which um, sort of brings people back to modern day. Um, it looks at the impact Titanic has had on film, music, TV, literature, pop culture, and also on Belfast today. Um, we also obviously had to put in our Jack and Rose pose because um, it's one of our most requested features um, over the 10 years. People used to come to the building and stand and the arms went out everywhere they were. So this is just a nice wee nod to the movie in this space. It brings a little bit of a light-hearted beat after the emotional experience you've just had in the ship, part, um, the ship of dreams gallery. Um, and it sort of brings people, just gives them a moment to kind of emotionally recharge after what they've seen um, before they leave. So this is very low-key in terms of innovation here. We have um, lots of physical props, um, all the wild and wonderful things that Titanic has inspired from all over the world. Um, probably my personal favourite is a um, Titanic-shaped diamond de monte encrusted handbag that really you couldn't fit anything but a lipstick in. Um, so this, is, this is just has a little bit of um, a sort of interactive here that has um, a quiz. You can kind of test your Titanic knowledge, that kind of thing. But it is quite low tech engagement here, just because we need that space to be a little bit lighter as people go out. So that's really it. This sort of shows what we what we have done in the Titanic experience to really enhance the visitor experience. The feedback we have re received so far, um, we only opened the start of last month, so quite early days, but. Um, 
the feedback we've received has been overwhelmingly positive. You know, people are absolutely loving the changes. And as I say, we do have people coming away really emotional. And that's what we set out to achieve. So with this innovation, we're really happy that we have been able to enhance that visitor experience so that people leave and they really feel like they have been moved and made lasting memories emotionally. So if you haven't seen it, I'll just play a quick video just to end that might give you a little bit more of a, an idea of the type of innovation and technology that we have used. Thank you very much. Um, that was uh, really fascinating to see all the behind the scenes work and I think also to see how we love talking about technology and innovation, but it's not always about just doing it for the sake of it. So sometimes it's about those human interactions and those emotive experiences. Um, so great to see this continued investment after 10 years. This is also really important to make sure that we update and, and maintain that relevance. So next, I'd like to invite Nao Kerr, who's um, from the Nerve Center, uh, head of heritage and community, and will be taking us from, I guess, the ocean into outer space. So I'll let Niall tell you more about that and how you can experience that in the city of Derry. Over to you. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Um, no small feat. Uh, so yes, my name is Niall Kerr. I'm the head of heritage with the, with, the, with, the, with the Nerve Center, but also was the head of communications for Our Place in Space. Um, and for those who don't know what the Nerve Centre is, we are a creative media arts organisation based in the city here, deliver lots of artistic projects, community projects, outreach projects, uh, and digital innovation projects. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about this project, so our place in space, which was the, the Northern Ireland Commission as part of Unboxed. And Unboxed was a, a project established by the UK government a few years ago to celebrate creativity across the UK. We applied. Uh, and got some money through that, through that fund for our place in space. Uh, and it was the, the only project, or the, the lead project from Northern Ireland at that time. And what our place in space was uh, as a concept was using the solar system as a mechanism to have conversations about everything from identity to climate change, shared future, uh, culture. Uh, and I should say all the content that I'm showing through this presentation today is all content that we've used through the last year that this project's been live, just as a, a give a sense of the kind of uh, digital strategy that we've had. But first of all, I'm gonna pass over to, to the kind of brains behind the project uh, who can explain it a little bit better and a bit of uh, short-term context. Hello, I'm Oliver Jeffers, and I'm an artist. And I'm Professor Stephen Smart, and I'm an astrophysicist. For centuries, we humans have defined ourselves by who we are, and who we're not. By which side we support. By where we stand. By who and what we fight for. By what we believe. Quite simply, we divide ourselves into us and them. And all too often we get entirely hung up on these labels. Coming from Northern Ireland, we know all about this. I lived in New York City now for the last 15 years. And with distance comes perspective. But how much distance? Well, about 3,000 miles. But that's to New York. If you go straight up, the International Space Station is 240 miles away. And from there, astronauts begin to experience the overview effect, where it's just obvious that our planet is one giant single system. To the moon, it's nearly a quarter of a million miles. And only 12 people have ever made it that far and stood on the moon. From there, you can't actually see anything man-made at all. If we go even further, our nearest planet, Venus, it's 26 million miles, and Venus is about the size of the Earth. Hold on, our nearest planet is 26 million miles away? Yeah, that's right. What about the furthest planet? Well, that's Neptune. That's about 2.6 billion miles. I thought Pluto was the furthest planet. Well, it's a dwarf planet. You sort of don't count it anymore. Mm -hmm. But to get to the edge of the solar system, you need to travel 9 billion miles. 
kind of hard to comprehend just how much space there is in space. It's almost impossible to have a scale model of our solar system. If Earth were the size of a ping pong ball, the moon would be the size of a pea, about a meter distance. Is that a meter? We are. Perfect. Yeah, okay. And on this scale, the furthest planet, Neptune, would be about the size of a small melon. I happen to have one right here. And how far away would this be? About eight miles. Eight miles, right, okay. So what would happen if we could view ourselves alone on a tiny planet? The only one that can harbor life from the far reaches of our solar system. Well, we intend to find out. And our prediction is, with enough distance, us and them simply become... So that is the concept for our place in space, in a nutshell. That is the, the pitch video that we put together to apply for the funding uh, and we're successful with. So what we've, done, what we've tried to do with, with our place in space is to showcase some of the best of creativity from, from Northern Ireland. So we've taken an artist in Oliver Jeffers, critically acclaimed, world-renowned, children's book author and artist, paired him up with the, uh, of the astrophysicist Stephen Smart, and, and used space as an accessible medium through which to have a conversation. And space is a concept which we're all familiar with. We're all, I think, excited about in some way, and it's a universal concept. It's, it's known the world over. It's exciting. People are interested in space. Oliver brings to the project a kind of huge reach and interaction because he is so universally recognized, and then it's always underpinned by, by science know-how. So it's taking the best that we have from here and putting that on a global scale. And we were very much starting from scratch on this project. So we, we, we had the funding in, in late 2020, pulled this project together in a year and delivered it all the way through 2022 and into this year, into 2023. So we, we, ha we really had to kind of work hard to showcase the project, to build our audiences, uh, and to showcase what we were trying to do uh, through all of the various mediums. And as I said, it was about a, a, a kicking off point of conversations about everything from you know, identity to climate to our future. And they've talked very much about us and them, that concept of us and them throws, or flows through Oliver's work quite a lot as well. So what we've done uh, is take that, that idea and applied it into the real world. So we came up with the concept, or Oliver developed the concept, to have a, a solar system trail, sculpture trail, and at a scale of 591 million to one. And for those who are good at their maths, that means that the Earth, or sorry, the Sun is about two and a half meters across, and at that scale, the Earth is about the size of a table tennis ball, and then all the planets are to scale along that. So we developed this as a, as a sculpture trail that would tour to different locations across Northern Ireland and across the UK. It started off here in the city, in Derry, uh, last year, uh, one year and three days ago, I think it was at this point, and we kicked it off with the Guinness World Record, for anybody who remembers, which I'll touch upon in a second as well. What we're trying to do with each of these was almost to produce um, like a new tourism experience each time. So every time it toured, we had a different concept around where it was, different partners we were working with. Uh, so in Derry, it started in Bay Road Park, all the way uh, in through the city uh, and out the, the Greenway on the other side. When it went to Belfast later in the year, it was in partnership with the National Trust uh, and Divis and Black Mountain. Uh, each time trying to have different conversations about different things uh, that that environment allowed us to, to do. We then took it to, to Cambridge uh, in the summertime, uh, which started in uh, Midsummer Common in the heart of Cambridge. You mentioned Cambridge earlier, I'm not sure if you, were there. Nick, you might know this, Nick. So we were able to work with uh, the University of Cambridge for this, for this leg of the tour. Started in Midsummer Common and ran all the way to, to Water Beach at the end. We had an unexpected stop in Liverpool later in the year, and this was due to the success of the project when it was in Cambridge. Um, the, the funder were very keen to see it extended somewhere else in England. We talked to Liverpool City Council, Culture Liverpool, and they helped us bring it there in October, November last year. And then finally, back to the Ulster Transport Museum uh, here, in, just outside Belfast uh, in Cultural, running along uh, the Greenway and the Northland Coastal Path into Bangor. And as a full experience, just completed a few weeks ago. But the beauty of the project is that you can still visit the Ulster Transport Museum and, and navigate your way from, from the sun to Mars, which is on the grounds of the Ulster Transport Museum. 
And, and it was always free, and the experience has always been free for anybody to get involved in. And, and even still, so if you, if you have the chance, you can go and visit at the Ulster Transport Museum for free. So in the last year, the experience has been visited by, we think, just over 1.5 million people. It's ongoing at the Ulster Transport Museum, so people can still visit and take part. We had an events program with over 160,000 people, featuring everybody from uh, DJ David Holmes to Nobel Prize winner Brian Smith, Chelsea Clinton, Jamie Dornan, and a few others. The aim of the project all the way through was to try and engage as many people as possible with, uh, in, in as many different ways as possible, I suppose, with the themes, with the content, uh, and using digital content as a way to try and do that. So one of the, the things we tried to do, so you'll see that the trail itself is a physical tangential trail, which you can experience. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, you, you walk the solar system, you navigate the solar system. Uh, and that's, that was a fun experience, lots of people can get involved in that, but alongside the physical, we wanted to, to try and use digital as much as possible. And one of the ways that we did that, and Nick touched upon it earlier, was to create an app. So we had the Air Place and Space app, which you can still download uh, and still use. Um, we wanted to put digital at the core of this. So uh, the good thing about, about this project and having Oliver Jeffers as the artist and the creative involved in it, he has audiences the world over. He's a, he's a world recognized name. So we're able to use his content to plug into this, into this experience. So people could, could use this app and be instantly recognize his work and be attracted to and want to use it. Um, you can use it both in person and remotely, so you could use it to augment your experience while at the trail, but you can also use this app at home now to experience the planets in augmented reality as well. You can, as you're uh, navigating the trail, you can collect Oliver Jeffers' space characters along the way and view those in augmented reality. You can track your, your steps through the solar system. Uh, you can look back and see what's happening on Earth at the same time. Uh, I can see Nick trying to download the app right now, and I'm just Slightly panicked that it won't work, but here's hoping. Uh, you can learn more about the planets as you go along, so it's an educational experience too. You can launch, launch a personalized star into space, and as I mentioned before, you can view the, the planets in augmented reality at home. So we've, we realized that people were, you know, this is a, an attractive experience for people while they're at the trail to, to kind of augment the whole experience, the physical experience, but also we can use this in education settings. Uh, while we're doing our, our, our kind of um, outreach and digital education work as well. It's fun, rewarding, quirky and educational all at the same time. And delighted to say that it's now uh, been nominated for and won three awards, most recently at the Digital DNA Awards in Belfast. Alongside all that content, we ran a really comprehensive digital marketing campaign that was pretty much always on due to the, the sort of condensed nature of the projects. We, we launched this project in April last year, and I've been ever delivering it right across the last year, until, up until March of this year. Um, and the amount of outputs that were being constantly generated through the project meant that we always had to have that kind of always on attitude. Social was a huge focus for us, as, on using, as many, using all the social channels in different ways to engage different audiences. Uh, using social creatively, and trying to create different content for different channels, watching trends. We used some targeted ads across YouTube uh, and Google uh, as, uh, through, some, through some campaigns. But ultimately, we're trying to build audiences in as many different ways as possible in, in, as many, uh, in a short time frame. So we did that through newsletters, uh, using competitions, being playful with an interactive kind of tone of voice and incentivizing people to, to get involved. So we knew that when we were going to, to Cambridge, for example, we built up this huge bank of content uh, that explained the project. But then we had to build the audience in Cambridge to talk to. So we were able to, to run targeted ads in advance of that to help us. Uh, we worked with, with external partners as well through our media campaigns. This is just a snapshot of a, three, a 360 virtual tour while it was here in Derry. That's Bay Road Park. And we, we got a drone up. We got some nice 360 uh, capture of that. And we're able to use that then to create an interactive tour, which we could use online to explain what the, what the tour was to visitors before they would come and see it. We had imagery and content sort of coming out of our ears. Uh, we had in-house capture. Um, we turned the water down a wee bit, just is that OK? So we had uh, an in-house capture team who were, were kind of constantly capturing content through the project and then using that to share it public, optimizing video content for different social channels, uh, using drone films, using kind of on the ground, using content that was being captured and shared with us through audiences locally.
collaborated with, with Oliver, we had huge, huge audiences, we collaborated with external partners to kind of maximize the reach of this content. We had an online competition, for example, when the, the trail was at Divis to, to get people to go up, go up there, capture their own content, share that with us, and kind of generate that, that kind of full circle. And we also then were able to do different things. So when we launched the project last year in April, we had a Guinness World Record attempt for the most people dressed as astronauts, which I'm glad to say we, we had, which we won. We had 768 people and a dog uh, dressed as astronauts, uh, and that smashed the world record. Uh, but the reason I mention this is that we worked with a local influencer, so Adam B, who's a YouTube star from Derry, worked with him in advance to kind of raise awareness of that. Uh, and then he was there on the day himself, kind of interacting with the crowd, interacting with the audience, and, uh, and helping us to kind of smash that record. And likewise, Oliver, and this is another sort of influencer from Dublin, a guy called Mark Langtree, the science communicator. So working with people to try and help us to share the message in as many different ways as possible. The record has since been beaten, I'm afraid to say, uh, but we don't dwell on that too much. The fact is we won it uh, last year. One of the other things we, we did as well was to work with uh, STEAM advocates, so people from across science, technology, engineering, arts and maths, one of them being the astronaut Chris Hadfield uh, with the engineer Ella Podmore, another astronaut called Nicole Stott, the author Neil Gaiman, to produce content as part of a creative challenge series. So Oliver would pose challenges, have a conversation with these people, they would then pose a challenge about how we can make the world a better place uh, and share their experiences around that as well. And again, this is working with with recognizable industry names from across the world who could sh help to share the message. Um, part of this was getting young people to generate their own content and incentivizing that through schools uh, and, and youth centers, etc. And then more recently, uh, we just in the last two weeks launched the Our Place in Space Minecraft World. Planet Earth just went is live your home and everyone Minecraft else's. Marketplace. Uh, a the human race has always thought that the earth was so big that it needed to be divided up into smaller bits. Although we haven't always agreed on the best ways to do this. Explore our place in space in this unique Minecraft educational adventure and travel through the solar system and Earth's history. Space is big, really, really big. To demonstrate this, as you drive in your little car to, let's say, Mars, that would take about 148 years. As I said, space is big. Once you reach Mars, you can travel back in time on Earth and witness some of the issues we faced in our corrected past. War, famine, slavery, even fake news. Learn about us and them, and why, really, we are all us on our little blue planet. That's a very quick muscle stop tour of some of the things that our place in space has done in the last year. Happy to have a conversation more detail afterwards if anybody would like. Just to end by saying that the project continues to have its own legacy. Uh, we've applied for and been successful with some funding through the British Council to take a version of the project to Vietnam later this year. So the Air Place and Space Trail will pop up in Hanoi uh, in October, we think, in some capacity. And a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with New York about having it in Times Square and ending in Governor's Island. So it continues to have a really strong legacy, and yeah, we'll continue to see where, where we can take it. So. Thank you. Well, I think just a huge congratulations to that. That, that is um, a, a massive achievement, both in numbers, but also in everything you pulled off and how you've used AR to create such an educational and immersive uh, discovery, which gets people far, far beyond um, all the fringes of the cities that you've been in. So congratulations. Um, so moving, uh, moving on, I'm very pleased to invite Ronan to come to the stage. Um, Ronan is going to be talking about the Tower Museum and staying with the same theme, talking about how you've incorporated VR to also create uh, interesting, immersive educational experiences. So over to you. Uh, thanks, Nick, and thanks, everyone. I'm very grateful to be here today. I'm sure you're all gasping for a cuppa, so already we have something in common. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm here to talk about some of the uh, just uh, digital innovation we've had to, we've, we've been privileged to be a part of in the Tower Museum. We're just a small museum. We have a small space, and we're trying to visualize or get visitors to visualize an environment that no longer exists, an historic environment um, in the city here and in, in the landscape. So I'm just going to take you through those and just talk through them really quickly to give you an idea. 
So uh, again, these are fully immersive experiences. Um, they use mainly VR headset, um, but we also incorporated some AR as well in, in terms of promoting them and, and, um, and using social media. We use a variety of hardware and software, and the topics are 19th century immigration, the first Neolithic settlers, the first world war. And towards the end, I'm gonna talk about the new Dairy Girls experience that we're uh, launching in the city in July. So that's very exciting for us as well. This is all part of the Tide project, which is um, uh, uh, Interreg, European Interreg project project, which uh, includes other countries around Western Europe as well, and we're looking at niche maritime heritage and how to promote and develop that heritage for tourism. So, uh, afloat and ashore, uh, this is our first one. This was very exciting for us. Uh, over a million people left the port just right outside the window here to the right um, over the course of about 300 years, and that diaspora has, has exploded exponentially all around the world. For many people, Derry was the last place they seen when they left this country in terms of migration. And so we wanted to kind of capture that because the port's no longer here. It has moved up river. And so when you stand and look out to the right and look over that series of houses there, or, or row of, uh, and Foyle Street, that's where you start your experience. That's where the port was. And that's where everyone left as they emigrated to a new life, whether it was in America or Australia um, or different places. So we used primary sources. We used a solicitor who wrote some diaries about the trips that he took, leaving here and heading to New York multiple times, and all the people he met and the immigrants that he met. His name is Patrick Maxwell. It's just occurred to me that he's from East Wall, and East Wall is exactly where you're sitting right now. So uh, it's nice to be able to talk about him uh, today. Um, we, he created these characters as he uh, uh, left on the ship called the State of Nebraska and these characters existed and so we recreated them faithfully from the diaries using green screen and local actors we used our archives our original posters that are from that period talking about you know um, the rules and different things and advertisements and posters for migration so we brought them and scanned them and brought them into the experience also we used hotels and buildings from drawings that no longer exist that have since either been raised or collapsed and we recreated them and um, the guild hall just been built so we did a lot of work to try and accurately uh, recapture what the port looked like um, and for many and it's been very popular um, combining these digital experiences, 95% of it is based on primary sources, based on things that have been written about or that actually happened and then the rest of the dialogue we just kind of made up to kind of move the story along but um, it lasts about eight minutes and uh, I have a little kind of ad here just to show you what it's, what it's kind of about, so I'm going to play that now. Um, we worked with Urban Scale Interventions and Zubra Curio in Bristol to pull this experience together. But for many people, it, had, it was a hugely emotional experience for them, especially when they come down and imagine what their ancestors would have experienced when they left these shores. S leaving here, a kind of a city lit by gas and gas lamps, sailing across the Atlantic and reaching a landscape that's entirely lit by electric power and sailing past the newly created Statue of Liberty. I mean, it's really emotional for people and uh, we've had brilliant feedback from that and that's very popular and is free and freely accessible in the Tower Museum um, at the moment. So our next experience was called Beware Enemy Below and this was uh, more exciting, more for kind of families, younger audiences and a little bit more about that towards the end but this was a joint partnership between uh, Donegal County Councils, uh, Derry City and Stavane District Council, and also Devon County Council. We all have one thing in common. We all experienced Allied convoys in the First and Second World War, and so we wanted to recreate that. And again, we got fully realized landscape, um, which is about the kite balloons, which uh, protected convoys in the First World War, and they basically went way up into the sky, and they looked out for U-boats as you sailed around the north coast of Ireland. So we thought, oh, this will be fun. We'll go up in a balloon, and we'll look around, and it'll be great. We didn't realize that some people, you know, they're afraid of heights, and this is genuinely terrifying if you're afraid of heights. It really is. Um, highly recommend it. It's a great thrill. Um, and, and so we scripted with um, historic consultants, and it's, it's very dangerous. You know, feels dangerous and feels exciting. It's completely different to floating the shore, but again, completely immersive. You're in there. You feel like you're going up in the air, so I'm just going to play a little bit from that too. Welcome on board the HMS Margaret, the flower of the Royal Navy's destroyers. We're under attack. Can you see anything? There's a U-boat, northwest. 
east of the convoy. Again, we used photogrammetry and used actual objects from our museum collections from the First World War and recreated them in 3D and they're in the little basket, the radio, the headset, the phones, everything has a link to our collections and our museum collections that we've tried to digitise to recreate these experiences. Um, we promoted them through social media, we used Instagram camera to, if you couldn't be there and used a VR headset, then you could use AR and transport yourself to that landscape using uh, Instagram and go straight into it. Um, and different ways like that to kind of connect with audiences. But when I talked about aiming it at younger audiences and families, I mean, everybody kind of found excitement through it because in many ways, the digital experience, it's not, a, it's not about the content, it's about the experience, you know. So for kids running around on deck, you know, four or six years of age, they didn't know what it was about, but they loved running around deck and trying to jump into the water and a float on the shore and similarly on the kite balloon as well. And that's something memorable for them. So that was a big learning for us and was also very exciting. Um, and these are just, we created a booth just to visualize what it looked like. It was a booth and a space and you put on your headset and you in into it and you could walk around and move around within that space. And if you feel like you're going to walk into a wall, a barrier would appear visually in front of you so that wouldn't happen. And if you did walk or run into a wall, which people love doing for some reason, I don't know why, the wall is nice and soft and cushioned so no harm will come to you. Um, so, I mean, we just, this, this launched the Maritime Festival, we have a brilliant Maritime Festival that happens um, uh, every second year here in the city and, and it's just fantastic and we re had the opportunity to launch that last July and it's been flying ever since. Um, on the back of the success of these, uh, we got funded to do one more using the same equipment and this is called Island City and this is just the concept at the moment but basically where you're standing used to be an island completely surrounded by water from 9,000 years ago, the first settlers that came up here and they settled in that island and from that point on this city has seen some of the most major uh, historical events that completely changed uh, the course of human history, particularly in Europe um, and in many ways when you step back and look at that over the course of 9,000 years, instead of just kind of looking at particular events, you can see it take place on a map, and that map, that interactive map, if you think of like the intro to Game of Thrones, that's exactly what this experience is going to be when you look at it. And the common theme throughout these three experiences is migration and the movement of people. So whether you were the first settler coming up the river 9,000 years ago in one of the earliest settled parts of northwestern Europe, or whether you were part of the ecclesiastical kind of powerhouse and kind of uh, beacon of Christianity during the Dark Ages, or whether you were here as part of the plantation, which formed the blueprint for the colonization of America, or whether you were here for the siege of Derry, which um, changed the course of history because it solidified the Protestant ascendancy, um, or whether you were here to migrate and depart for a new world and become part of that diaspora, or you were part of the key to victory in the Second World War and the Battle of the Atlantic. Everything happened here in this city, but it's never been contextualized in one six-minute experience. So that's a big challenge for us that we're really excited about doing um, because our landscape is defined increasingly by the movement of people. So whether you're here for a weekend as tourists or visitors, or whether you're here for a few months to lob cannonballs at the walls, or whether you're here to actually settle, um, it's been completely defined by a movement of people and tourism is a huge part of that and so when people come here and immerse themselves completely in that experience all they're really doing is adding to the story that's been here for thousands of years so it's great to be a part of that and great to have that as part of the tourism office offer in the city and it's thank you all very much